asshole that looked away. The American Sports Cavalcade. A panorama of speed, color, drama, and excitement. The American Sports Cavalcade. mighty Mississippi River, from its headwaters in Minnesota to its New Orleans Delta, influences all who live on or near it. Maybe it's the steady, constant flow of its waters and the tugs and barges that ply it that helps create the nice and easy way of life so many Southerners prefer, such as here in Memphis. But one of the things they like that's real fast is their race cars, and that's what we'll all enjoy tonight. I'm Steve Evans, and welcome to Memphis Motorsports Park, one of the finest half-mile dirt track facilities in all the world. As tonight we bring you the World of Outlaws Big Muddy Showdown, sprint car racing at its very best. The infield pit area is full of names you sprint car fans will recognize. Swindell, Whoopgang, Howden's Child, Hillenburg. If you don't follow sprint cars regularly, boy, are you in for a treat. In fact, let's have our buddy Brock Yates define just what is a wing sprint car. Well, Steve, to me, the outlaw sprint car is the embodiment of a racing machine. They've been around in one form or another for as long as dirt track racing has existed in the United States, almost 100 years now. They're very simple machines, really just a tubular chassis mounting a giant engine, in this case a 700 horsepower Chevy V8, but they are essentially symbolic, traditional American racing automobiles. And in all cases, they carry this beautiful streamlined tail. That is the trademark of the sprint car, no matter where you see it anywhere in the United States. Nowadays, of course, they carry a roll cage, they carry a big wing, but for all intents and purposes, they're unchanged. Demanding to drive, extremely competitive, demanding the best racing drivers, in my opinion, in the United States. We're gonna see them here tonight at Memphis, and believe me, as always, the outlaw sprinters are gonna put on the best show ever. And the show started earlier tonight with this heat race number one. One of three heats, ten laps each, to determine the field for the main events to come later tonight. And as always, Steve, the top four cars, the top four finishers, were to advance to the feature event. So it was critical, especially for local favorite Bobby Davis Jr., who started back in the fifth row, Steve. And, of course, he had to work his way up to get into the feature. And in the first heat, Brock, it can be very difficult to pass. The racetrack has no rubber down on it. In fact, is a big question mark itself. And here was the start of heat number one, and it was the 77 car, the orange machine, with Frankie Kerr executing a beautiful start. Number two at Steve Siegel, the white car settled into second, but he was challenged almost immediately. By the 4A car, that red automobile of Rick Unger out of Indianapolis, Indiana, back there in the third spot, but then, Randy Wolf in the 5W and Chris Eish in the yellow 17E, they moved up to challenge Unger for the third spot. And of course, those three guys were in that struggle for that fourth place, which is a critical spot in this event. Oh, absolutely. It means you completely bypass the B main and go directly to the main event. And no one had to tell Chris Eish that in the 17E car, the yellow machine, he was giving it everything he had to not have to run that extra distance later on. And with Frankie Kerr in the 77 car winning it, Chris Eish also accomplished his mission. He got that fourth position. So Frankie Kerr won the first 10 lap heat here at Memphis, but more important perhaps, Bobby Davis Jr. and Mike Ward, two local favorites, didn't make the cut. They'll have to race in the B main. Steve spoke with a winner. Well, Frankie Kerr crawling out, the first man to see a checkered flag tonight. Terrific. Thank you. Your impressions of the racetrack. It looks pretty tacky. It's uh, real tacky. Um, I've never been here before, but it's one of the tackiest racetracks we've been on this year. What are your other impressions of uh, Memphis? It's fast. You like fast? Yeah, we run on big tracks at home, and it's kind of like being at home. Okay, Brock? Well, Chris Eish, uh, hard-fought battle, but fourth place, which uh, gives you the transfer spot to the main, so it's got to be a pretty good feeling. Well, yeah, you know, you want to want to get in the qualifying spots. You don't have to go through that mess in the B main and everything. So, you yeah, know, we're pretty happy with that. Chris, let me ask you about uh, your origins. You're from Maryland, where there's a lot of late model racing, I know, but not too many guys in the, uh, in the Outlaws. Uh, what brought you into Sprinters? 
Well, you know, I, I raced in the Pennsylvania area, and uh, I've been going to the races, you know, ever since I can remember. And, uh, you know, so we, we raced in Pennsylvania, and we, we felt like we'd be pretty competitive on the outlaw circuit, so we went out there and run it. So you kind of like the open wheels and the, and, and the sprinters better than the, the late models back home, huh? Yeah, them races are kind of boring. <laughs> Taxi cabs, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks. Well, there'll be nothing boring about the B Main later on in our show with Mike Ward, Bobby Davis Jr., and Lee Brewer forced to run there. It could be quite a show. Stick with us. We'll be back to Memphis. Well, that giant earth mover is just one of thousands of uh, enormous machines that line the Mississippi River from the Gulf all the way to Minnesota. This particular one loading gravel here in Memphis, Tennessee. The river, of course, an artery of commerce ever since the settlers came in the last century. Great cities like Memphis formed along the river banks, and naturally thousands and thousands of their citizens depend on the river for their livelihood. But when the nightfall comes, they show up in places like the Memphis Motorsports Park for more World of Outlaws action. And tonight, Brock, I think they'll all be darn glad they came. In fact, they've already seen some pretty good action. We've shown you heat number one, and here's how they lined up for heat number two earlier. Tim Green from California, local favorite Eddie Gallagher. A very competitive front row and one sure to provide a lot of action. Back in row number three, another local favorite, that is Jeff Swindell. You know, back in the mid-50s when Chevrolet first introduced the small block Chevrolet V8, the sprint car clan was quick to jump on it, and in those days they ran it virtually stock. Not so anymore. The strides they have made are absolutely amazing in the horsepower department. I guess what we ought to do is start a little remedial lesson in sprint car power plants. Actually, they're about all the same, but we ought to kind of go over the numbers one more time. This is a classic unit, kind of an over-the-counter sprint car power plant. Actually, none of them are over-the-counter. They come from... Uh, uh, short blocks made by guys like Donovan and Rodak on the West Coast, and then they're custom built by a variety of primarily Midwest engine builders. What it turns out is a maximum displacement of 410 cubic inches. They run on straight alcohol, no additives allowed, purely fuel injected, dry sumped, about between 13 to 15 to 1 compression ratio. They'll generate between 700 and 800 horsepower, depending on whose dynamometer you read. And uh, believe it or not, are very pricey. They cost about between maybe twenty, twenty-two thousand dollars with all the plumbing on board. That sounds like a lot, but they'll run for a long time. And the advantage of an aluminum block over an iron block, which is cheaper, is that they're easily maintained. If you break something, they can usually be welded and patched back together. So. It's a really high-value investment and, overall, a very reliable racing engine. So reliable, in fact, that the valve covers will probably never come off that machine during the course of an evening. And this race is part of the Copenhagen School World of Outlaws Shootout Series that crisscrosses the United States. Nobody travels harder than the Outlaws, Brock. Oh, boy. They will run over 60 races coast to coast in the course of a season. But this particular heat got underway, Steve, with Tim Green jumping off the pole and establishing a strong lead, but immediately challenged by Eddie Gallagher in the white number one car, the local favorite. Notice the speed traps at 119 miles an hour down the back straightaway, so these cars were whistling. And, of course, everyone in the stands, including yours truly, thought, well, boy, Eddie Gallagher, he's the local hero in that number one, the white car. He'll know the quick way around when all of a sudden here came Pennsylvania driver Don Kreitz Jr., his first time ever here at Memphis. That's the 69K car to challenge for second. Well, Kreitz uh, stayed in that low groove. You could see that uh, he was trying to get Gallagher down low, but Eddie stayed up high for a while, still running in the 118, 119 mile an hour uh, uh, speed trap uh, zone very quick for a flat half mile like this in Memphis. Uh, right behind these guys with Danny Lasoski in the fourth spot in that white number five. He was unchallenged, but Kreitz showed a lot of patience and moved underneath Gallagher to take over that second spot. Well, Tim Green won the heat taking the checker, but all eyes were on Don Kreitz Jr. He really had the fans buzzing here at Memphis tonight. Green, Kreitz Jr., Gallagher, Lasoski, of course, go directly to the A main. However, Keith Kaufman and Jeff Swindell, a couple of crowd favorites, will not. Brock was waiting for Tim Green. Well, Tim Green uh, just breaks away from the pack and uh, moves on to win the second heat. Tim, uh, would they all be uh, that easy, right? It'd be nice, wouldn't it? But <laughs> we got lucky, got a good starting spot in the heat race because we didn't qualify so good, but the feature's going to be a different deal, so... Is the racetrack, I noticed uh, we had a position change there right at the end, and, uh, and it looked as if the racetracks, maybe the grooves widening out a little bit now. 
Well, I think it is. It's a little bit rough, just about a car width off the pole in each corner, and it makes it kind of hard to pass on. But I think as the race, as the night goes on, it might widen out a little bit, make it a little bit, hopefully, for more passing. Because where I got to start, I'm going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, what about the chassis setup? Are you going to make any changes? Uh, probably just tire change, maybe a gear change. I'm not real sure. Just kind of watch the track and see what happens. Okay, good. Well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Now let's go to Steve with second. Okay, Brock, we've got the second place finisher piling out of this car. They get harder and harder to get out of every year. You know, Don, no matter if it's a, a good race in a heat or the A main, it's always fun when you've got competition like that. Yeah, this uh, first time we were ever at this track, and uh, it's a really nice facility and uh, got a well of a bunch of cars here, that's for sure. Tell me about the banking here compared to some other tracks that are your favorites. Uh, it's not banked, you know, too much, especially against a track like uh, Eldor, but uh, even, uh, you know, with the slight banking, you can still run this track just about wide open all the way around. And wide open it was going to be as they set up for heat number three, another 10-lapper that, of course, would advance four more of these stars to the A main. Jack Hewitt, one of the veterans of USAC here, Joe Garrity from the engine building family. Good, strong field. Andy Hillenberg out of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. All of these drivers not only facing this difficult racetrack, but also a very chilly evening. Earlier, Steve had a look at how the crew chiefs keep these temperamental engines running in the chill. How cold is it tonight in Memphis? Well, a lot of the crews have gone through some ancient old race car technology they hardly ever use anymore. Oil heaters. And take a look at this. It's kind of crude, but very effective. This is the 56 car of Danny Smith. Now, they've plunged this down into the dry sump tank that holds about 12 quarts of 30, 50 weight oil. Now, to heat the oil up, there's a wire that runs down through that pipe and back up to this kind of crude but effective uh, rheostat here. And you can see a little smoke already coming out. So this oil is just about up to temperature. Usually on hot summer nights, when the engine is up to operating temperature, they actually have to add a pint of oil thickener to protect the innards of the motor. But tonight, it's heating up the oil. Ooh, that feels good. Try the other hand. <laughs> okay, 10 cars, 10 laps in this third heat here in the Big Muddy Showdown as they got ready to go. And Danny Smith with uh, that uh, warm engine oil in his sump apparently working just fine because he came off the pole in that red 56 car to take the lead. With the 23S orange machine of Jack Hewitt hugging the inside line of the beautiful black number seven of Randy Smith falling into third spot. Now Hewitt decided to see if maybe Tim Green was right and go up high and see if there was any traction. There wasn't. Well, Danny Smith continued to hold off to it, but he was showing some serious signs of engine problems. There's some smoke out of that uh, left bank of cylinders as he comes down, came down the front straightaway, and it looked like Smith might not be able to hold Hewitt off. Well, maybe uh, a little oil was escaping, but certainly the horsepower was all there, as uh, Jack Hewitt found out, because all he could do was stare at the back of that machine. He couldn't pick up any ground on him whatsoever, as hard as he might try. So Danny Smith came down the front straightaway at over 120 miles an hour to take the checkered flag here in the third heat at uh, the Big Muddy Showdown. Joe Garrity and Randy Smith also made it work going directly to the A main. Brock Yates talked to Danny. Kind of frustrating to run good and know that you got a hurt motor. Yeah, the track's really, you know, track's really fast. We start up front. It's easy to win you, when you start on the front. Well, we hope you get it fixed. All right, thanks. Yeah. Some sprint car teams would just change motors. Well, Danny can't because he doesn't have a spare tonight, so he has to fix the problem itself. It's in the oiling system, the scavenger pump. He's trying to find one right now to participate in the A main. Stay with us. We'll be right back to Memphis Motorsports Park. Welcome back, everyone, to Memphis Motorsports Park. And that noise you hear in the background is a circle track tradition warming up. Right, Brock? Well, it is, Steve. Uh, they're starting what they call the trophy dash, which has been a tradition for the past qualifiers for as long as I can remember in midget and sprint car racing. And I really don't know what the origins are. I remember a long time ago, I think they were also called helmet dashes. And I don't know whether that's because you won a helmet or you won a trophy or what it is, but they've sure been around a long time. You know, I think back in those days, you did indeed win a helmet, as I recall. Well, I remember uh, reading about it in the old days at Ascot and some of the uh, great old racetracks in the 1930s. But uh, I guess it always is a tradition. And I guess you either start four cars or six cars. I don't think any more than that. But it's always the quick guys. Yeah, absolutely. Always the quickest. And it's usually a super strong race. Okay, well, the Joby Dash is warming up. Let's enjoy it. 
Okay, what's at stake here? Well, starting position in the A main for one and a couple of bucks for two. And, of course, outlaw pride for three. That's always important. Look at that row, too. Doug Wolfgang, Jack Hodgenchild, the two quick qualifiers here. Randy Smith and Chris Eish, we saw them run earlier. They're in the back row, the starting fifth and sixth spots. But I think, Steve Evans, that two guys to watch are those two in the middle. And the reason we didn't see Wolfgang or Howden's child in heat racing action, well, one of the rewards for qualifying one or two is to bypass that. And, of course, the quick qualifier tonight was Jack Hodgenchild. Broke the track record at 16.6 seconds. But right now, it's Donnie Christ Jr. who has the lead in the trophy dash. But look at the black and gold number 48 car. That is Jack Howden's child, and he is chasing him down. The young man from Pennsylvania, his debut night here at Memphis, and he's out in front of one of the best in the world. But here's the race for third. What a race it is. Hunger in the 4A, Doug Wolfgang in the 8D and 17E. Chris East going at it for that third spot. Wolfgang must have had some kind of a problem right at the start. Otherwise, I think he'd be up there with Howden's child and uh, with the young fellow from Pennsylvania, Price. Right now, he's got his hands full with Rick Hunger in that uh, red 4A. There you see Wolfgang in the white 8D trying to get around him on the outside. But I think that's a long way around here at Memphis tonight, Steve. I don't think that's going to work. I think Doug knows it. Boy, Doug sure pitched it sideways coming out of turn four there. Didn't he just got it up and set it up and tried to get a drive down that straightaway? There you see the interval between Donnie Christ Jr. and Jack Hodgenchild, the two leaders here. Hodgenchild seems to be able to move in on him a little bit on the uh, corners, but uh, Christ just moves away from him on the straight. Last lap down the back shoe, Donnie Christ Jr. heading into turn number three. Unless he bobbles, he's got a trophy dash victory in his hands. Plus, he'll start on the pole of the A main. Yes, he will. The race for third. Wolfgang cannot gun down Rick under the 4A car. Takes the third position. So the six quickest automobiles here at Memphis uh, shoot it out. And this young man, Donnie Christ Jr. from Sinking Springs, Pennsylvania, takes the victory. A bit of a surprise. A lot of people thought that Jack Hodgenchild and that beautiful black and gold 48 car could run him down, but not possible. Bright stayed low, tucked down against the fence here and just blew him away. So there are the final standings in the trophy dash here at Memphis. And of course, the big winner, Donnie Kreitz Jr. And Steve is with him. Well, I tell you what, this uh, Memphis crowd just gave a very warm welcome to the winner of the trophy dash, his first of the year. And Don, I'll tell you, this Memphis crowd and racetrack likes this car and you. Yeah, like I said earlier, it's really a nice uh, track. And uh, the only thing is, I don't know how close those guys are. I don't know if I can run like that for 20 laps. I know I had my hands full. <laughs> well, the car appears to be working flawlessly. And as I said, you're adapting well. Yeah, the, the crew has this car just working perfectly. Uh, earlier, we didn't, first time we were ever here, we didn't even get any practice. We had trouble with the engine, uh, but the crew had the car right, and it's just working perfectly. But you said you didn't know how many laps you could run like that. What do you mean? What might go? You or the car? Uh, pro probably me. It seemed like, uh, it, I guess from all the rain, the track is a little bit ripply, and uh, at these speeds here, you really have your hands full. If our camera can pan over to the left, I think you'll see the ripples that he's talking about this racetrack is very tough to move from one line to another could be a very treacherous surface dan again good luck thank you sir and try to keep the wheels out of those grooves because they'll do the steering for you if you don't let's go to brock with second well jack Cottonchild uh climbs out of his number 48 uh Jack, it looks as if uh, it looked as if you jumped right out to start, and you were going to run him down, and then you just kind of sat there in uh, in second place. Yeah, we, uh, uh, you know, we're just trying everywhere on the racetrack, and uh, and just kind of feeling the car out and stuff, and seeing where we could run good, and and we're right there, we're pretty quick, so we feel pretty good about the feature. Is the racetrack starting to widen out a little bit? Are we getting more in one groove? Yeah, I think you're going to be able to run anywhere on the racetrack real good. I mean, uh, you know, I think you can run the bottom or the top or anywhere, and. And it's going to be a good race. Good. It's loose. You loose everybody's loosening the car up a little bit. Uh, did you do the same thing? Got got in a few extra laps of practice, so, huh? Yeah, we got, uh, you know, we got to run a few laps there. So we'll probably loosen the car up a little more for the feature yet and uh, just go from there. Good deal. Well, good luck. Thanks, Thank Jack. You.
Well, what we've seen so far, Brock, may have been mere child's play compared to what's coming. The B main and the A main, especially the B with a bunch of outlaw regulars trying to salvage some pride against some hungry local racers. This is a man who represents an aged and honored tradition on the Mississippi River. This is Clyde Kitchen, and he's the pilot of the big diesel tugboat, the Betsy Diane. He controls the Betsy Diane with this little tiny joystick, which operates uh, jet thrusters that permits him to control not only the tug, but a barge load that sometimes extends several hundred feet out in front of the Betsy Diane. A tricky, tricky trade as he runs this river. We're back with more of the Big Muddy Showdown World of Outlaw Sprint Car Competition. I'm Steve Evans. He's Brock Yates. And Brock, the B-Main is coming up. You can transfer to the A-Main if you're in the top 10 tonight, but it's so hard to win that A-Main after going through this. Well, it's always kind of a nightmare event, you know. It's uh, it's the last chance deal. In fact, it used to be, remember, Steve, it used to be called a consolation race. Now they've kind of given it a little more uh, credibility by calling it the B-Main, but it's still, to the drivers, it's still the concierge of the consolation race. It's a last chance deal. And we've got some very fast guys in here. You know, we got Jeff Swindell and Bobby Davis Jr. and some of the guys that you expect that never run, for the most part, in the B-Main. And I think it's a problem here tonight because the racetrack's a little bit narrow. Although, I just talked to Jack Howdenchild, and he said that he thinks it's, you know, we're going to get a couple of more grooves here. And I think as this race, which is going to be a little bit longer, runs in, we're going to see some more passing. And I think we'll probably see some of the fast guys move up. Well, the, th the way things have worked out so far, this could be the best race of the night, right? Oh, very possible, yes. Desperate men do desperate things. <laughs> <laughs> Let's enjoy it again. So 10 of these drivers will advance to the feature race. Randy Wolf and Craig Keel on the front row. Kaufman, a very strong runner from Pennsylvania in the second row. Jess Wendell behind him. Mike Ward, a local favorite, strong runner right in there. Andy Hillenberg in the two car, a good stout runner. Ronnie Daniels, another local favorite. Bobby Davis Jr., clear back in row seven. Now, all of these guys are wondering if the setup is correct. They've only got one more chance to make the AMA. Earlier, Steve had a look at one of the critical ways to set up the chassis. Often, you'll hear these sprint car drivers refer to their machines as they come off the track as being tight or loose. Well, that's simple to explain. Tight means the car is just that. It's tight. It doesn't want to turn. If it's loose, well, that's the opposite. The car is moving around on the course, and all it wants to do is turn, including maybe some 360s. Before, they always had to jack weight around to combat those problems. Now, as we can show you on the beautiful black number two car of Andy Hillenberg, there's a new way to do that, and they're called spacers. Essentially, what you're doing is spacing out the right rear wheel, making the the rear end of the car wider. Now, the larger spacer you use, the looser the car is going to be. So if the car is tight and you've got this one in, well, you go to this one, this one, and if you really want her loose, you slide that on the splined axle. Of course, the problem is this, that the, in dirt track racing, the conditions constantly change. So you might start out with a perfect setup, racetrack switches around on you, and you wish you had another setup. As we head down for the green flag for the B main here at Memphis State, 12 laps of racing, 10 go to the A main. It is 5W Randy Wolf on the point of Rick Craig Teal, the red machine, trying to take him on the outside. All right, there it goes. Oh, big trouble in turn number two. That's Steve Beitler in the red 21. Rolled up along that steel guardrail. He's upside down as chief starter Richard Bailey throws the red flag to stop this race. It appears as if all the safety devices have functioned. The roll cage is intact. Uh, the shoulder harnesses and seat belts stayed in place, so perhaps Beitler's okay, Steve. Well, he may just be in an awkward position there, Brock, where if he unbuckles himself without some assistance, he's just going to fall on his head, compounding any injuries he might already have. All right, let's take another look at how this happened. There is Beitler in the right side of your screen. Started 14th. He's trying to move around 6M. Tim Monson tumbles over Monson's rear wheel and takes two very hard flips, rolling along the fence and coming to rest upside down. Apparently, though, everything is all right. He's out of the car, and Steve's with him. No, they've called for an ambulance, and uh, Steve is saying, I don't need an ambulance. I don't want an ambulance. If I have to go to the ambulance, I'll walk there on my own. Typical sprint car bravado. He appears to be okay. The emergency crews are here. And all he wants to do right now is go back to his own trailer and lay down. Pretty good sprint out here for us as well. But uh, it's worth it to see the relief in everybody's eyes. 
Steve, you okay? Yeah, I'm all right, yeah. A nasty one, though. Well, I told my dad I'd get on TV one way or the other. I guess this is it. It ain't the way I wanted it, though. No, I hadn't planned on meeting you quite like this. Do you know what happened? It happened so quickly. Yeah, somebody in front of me, I think it was Ronnie Daniels, bicycled real hard. When he come down, there just was nowhere to go. We were running real hard in the middle groove, and I, I ran up over his tire, and the speed on this track, it's just, it's not very forgiving. When you start, you get up on two wheels, and it comes down, man, it takes off. Well, you got to be proud of the race car and the men that build it. Yeah, Oscar, they're built in Indiana. They do a real good job. I have a lot of faith in their work. Right. Maybe you should go to the ambulance, huh? Nah, I'm okay. Okay, thanks. Let's ride you over in the car. Well, certainly he's just fine in the attitude department. And that was pretty typical of any kind of open wheel crash. When rubber meets rubber, something is going to happen, whether it's on a road course, an oval, or here on the dirt. But this car will race again. Most of the damage is in the suspension pieces. As you can see, the chassis is still good and straight. But what about the other machine? The 6M car of Tim Monson, who Steve Beitler ran over. Brock's there to check that out. Tim Monson, as you get ready for a restart, I know you're in, a, in that tangle a little bit. Did the race car get bothered at all? No. no did, did, did he get up on top of you, or uh, did, you, uh, did he just nudge you before he went out of the park? I don't think he even hit me. I just bicycled on my own. So you're OK? OK. Okay, so Tim Monson's all right. He waves him off. He's ready to go. And as I've said before, sometimes in motor racing, the driver is the last to know. We all know that indeed Steve Beitler did get on the right rear tire of Tim Monson. Stay with us for the restart of the B-Main. It will be coming right up here in Memphis. Logan Pass, Montana. And Along with Steve Evans back in Memphis, Tennessee, the big muddy showdown. The wreckage of Steve Beitler's car has been cleared away. Chief starter Richard Bailey signaling one more lap as we get started with the B main. A critical event here, Steve, because the guys that finish up front move on to the A main and the big money. And this is a brand new race, still 12 laps. The top 10 go to the A main. Tim Monson, who was involved with that 6M car in the earlier crash, he is restarting the event. Obviously, Steve Beitler is not. But the guy to watch up front, I think, in the first few rows is Keith Kaufman in the number three car. He's in the second row. And in the third row, Jeff Swindell in the 11X. Those two guys are out for blood. Very strong, very experienced drivers. We've got a green flag. And the poles that are the orange car. Bob W. Randy Wolf. He hangs on to first place. But here comes number eight, Craig Keel. And Craig just about tagged him in the rear. All right, there is your race for third. That is Keith Kaufman in the blue number three car. Right behind him, the 5 of Johnny Herrera. And they're going at it. As they come down the front straightaway, Keith Kaufman dives underneath Craig Keel in the red number eight and challenges for second place. You can see how difficult this racetrack has become as the cars are skitterish. They're trying to steer themselves in all of the grooves that we've been talking about on this racetrack. This is real man. Oh, and Mike Ward is in trouble in turn three. A couple of lazy loops lands right side up, even with the wing still on it. But one thing you can say about outlaw crashes, there are no two alike. Let's take a look in slow motion and see if we can determine what caused this man, Mike Ward, to flip that number 88 car and do really so little damage. When this happened, as we'll see, in front of Mike was the 11X car, Jeff Swindell, behind him, the pretty black machine, number two of Andy Hillenberg. Hillenberg goes around Mike, and he wasn't touched by anybody. The car just flat got out of control. It may well be the racetrack surface we talked about earlier, but what an interesting incident. If you could design your own crash, this is the kind of one you'd want to happen. Not only are you okay, but basically the machine is okay, and there's a good chance Mike Ward will rejoin the action. Mike Ward, are you all right? Yeah. This is better than the last time I saw you when you went out of upside down. Yeah, huh. a little bit better. What happened? Uh, caught a rut and it bicycled, and she just went over from there. Thank God for wings, right? Yeah, I don't think we hurt too much. We're going to go back out there. Good, good. Well, we sure hope so. Glad to see you're okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mike Ward, apparently all right. He says we're going to try to get going. I think maybe even this race car is ready to run. They're checking over the front wing, which seemed to take a little damage. And uh, the top wing, the big wing, has only got a little bit of a dent. It must have made a nice clear loop. Uh, that would be about a nine if he was a professional diver. But the question is, what caused the crash? Uh, he didn't touch anybody. It was probably track conditions, and Steve Evans is down in turn three to examine the probable cause. 
Well, we've heard a lot of drivers talking about grooves in the racetrack. Well, Mike Ward in the 88 car encountered the Grand Canyon. Take a look at this. He was down here, got onto this. I don't believe anybody touched him. It was this mound of dirt that is hard as a rock. It's this gumbo. You couldn't chisel it off this racetrack right now. It's been compacted by all the tires. This is what bit him, this treacherous piece of dirt. And it's probably going to remain here. So everybody's going to have to be very, very careful in this area of the racetrack. Boy, that's unbelievable. Yeah, maybe they ought to put a couple of highway flares and a barrier around that thing as we watch Mike Ward get restarted. He will be back in the action for more of the B-Main here from Memphis. Stay with us. We'll be back as well right after this. I'm sure like a lot of kids, when I was a little boy, one of my favorite toys was a crane. I would play with that hours on end, pretending to do what this man does in real life. And that's move incredibly huge and awkward objects, such as this cargo cover, which takes dozens of them for just this one barge. But look at the precision with which he can control that machine. There's so many precise occupations on the banks of the Mississippi River. Well, speaking of precise occupations, here's a man uh, who's got one, Mike Ward, in the 88 car. We saw him flip. He's back out on the track. He will restart the B-Main. All right, Mike Ward cruising a little more uh, tentatively out there, but full of enthusiasm. I'll tell you what, he's built like a fullback and about as tough as one. Mike Ward is just as gritty a sprint car driver as you can find. An example of this was last year here at Memphis, Tennessee, at the start of the A-Main. Ward in the back of the field gets hooked on the inside, is driven down onto the inside fence, tumbles twice, giant, spins and flips, and then lands in front of the rest of the field and is tagged by Bobby Davis Jr. and several other competitors then is shoved down onto the inside of the track. A very scary accident, and one that we thought when we were there that involved serious injury for Mike Ward. As it turned out, though, he was all right, a little bit uh, dazed for a few moments, but got out of the car and continued his career, thankfully, unhurt. So Mike Ward, two big crashes here at Memphis, but unfazed as he is ready with a whole bunch of other fine drivers to restart the B-Main. Jess Swindell back there in the sixth car, Andy Hillenberg behind him. And in the tenth spot, that's the transfer position. Bobby Davis Jr., one of the local favorites and one of the guys, Steve, that has had trouble getting that fourth car of his running tonight. Well, here's trouble. The six M car, Tim Monson, is in the pits, will not compete. Apparently, there was some damage uh, inflicted on that machine when he was hit by 21 Steve Beitler. And starting next to last will be the 88 car of Mike Ford. That's where they placed him. All right, we've got to start. Randy Wolf in the 5W, Craig Keel still in the 8 car, but Keith Kaufman right behind him. Remember, he was challenging when we had the Mike Ward caution. All right, there are your three leaders. Wolf, Keel, Kaufman. Kaufman in the blue number 3 car has his sights set on second place. He was working on Craig Keel out of Weedsport, New York, just before that uh, crash. Uh, slow things up and now he goes low down through turn number two and takes second place. Terrific move by Coffin. Here's the race for four at Lee Brewer Jr., the 32U, the red machine. That is the 11X car, the orange car of Jeff Swindell right behind it. And here back to the leaders, Randy Wolf and Keith Kaufman. Kaufman uh, moving in on Wolf, two Pennsylvania drivers. Kaufman, of course, one of the very best in this business, doesn't often run the full outlaw schedule. He hangs around those very tough uh, central Pennsylvania tracks, but when he comes in and runs against the outlaws, they know he's here. As Kaufman goes low against Randy Wolf and Adam Orange, number five, Kaufman will take the lead. He slips past Lee Brewer Jr., who slowed on the back straightaway. No apparent problem there, and it doesn't uh, bring out a caution. But now Wolf gets back by Kaufman. And brought number 88, Mike Ward, has moved all the way up from next to last in the 10th position, the final transfer spot. Bobby Davis Jr. is 7th, and between them is the 3-H car of Greg Hutnett. He's in 8th and 17th. Ronnie Daniels in 9th. So all of those right now could move ahead tonight. And back to that race for the second spot. Now Craig Keel has moved up to challenge Kaufman for the second spot as Randy Wolf has moved out a little bit on Kaufman. So these two drivers now going at it for that runner-up spot. Keel goes 
goes high on the red number eight, but can't get by. And you can see everybody staying as low as possible in turn number three, trying to avoid that burn that's out about a far length and a half or so from the rail. All right, Craig Keel, uh, just about to get into a new race car. He told me that this is the last show for this old girl, but he's giving it a good ride right now. Again, one of the finest guys in the business. A pair left to go. The two flags shown by Richard Bailey, the chief starter. He will give Craig Keel only one more shot to get by Keith Kaufman for the second position. Not much time remaining for anybody to make a move in that top ten. The race for the fourth position, there's the black car of Andy Hillenberg from Oklahoma. 11X, Jeff Swindell, a grandstand full of fans here for the local driver. Number two, Andy Hillenberg, right now, though, has a handle on that board that may not let go of it. And here's your leader, Randy Wolf, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, coming off turn number four to take the checkered flag here in the B main as he slides her through turn number one. Randy Wolf, a convincing victory, held off Keith Kaufman and moved down to the win. And what a gritty drive by Mike Ward. He flipped the 88 car, restarted it, and will go to the A main by the skin of his teeth. He finished in the 10th and final transfer spot. So, as we watch Randy Wolf slow that race car and roll into the pits, the winner here in the B main, let's take a look at the final results. Randy Wolf, of course, held off Kaufman after a very strong challenge mid-race. Keel, Hillenberg, Jess Swindell in uh, the fifth spot. But the more important uh, second uh, five, Hodnett, Kane, Bobby Davis Jr., Ronnie Daniels, and Mike Ward, who toughed it out for 10. And now let's go to Steve with the winner, Randy Wolf. Well, Brock, I am with the winner of the B-Main. And as you know, that was the place to be out front and stay out of trouble. Yeah, it's uh, with the racetrack just a little bit rough in the middle. Seems like you either have a bottom groove or maybe one above it. So there isn't a whole lot of racing room. Could you see that awful bump I called the Grand Canyon down there between uh, three and four that uh, tipped Mike Ward over? Could you see that from the cockpit? Uh, no, you couldn't. That's probably what's wrong. There's like l loose dirt laying around, and it is hard to decide where to run. Like you'd want to go into the top, but something would make you come down and then you get in the roughest part of the racetrack. And it is because it is hard to see where the top groove is because of the loose dirt. Let's talk about the business end of a sprinter, that being this right rear tire. That's the first thing your crew came over to look at. What do you see looking at this tire? Well, it looks good to us. We had a softer tire on earlier and it chewed the leading edge, but this tire looks real well. It's probably what we'll go with in the main. All right, we'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Brock. Well, Steve, I'm with Keith Kaufman, who uh, ran a good, strong second in the B main. Uh, you got by Keel, and then uh, couldn't seem to run down uh, the first place man. Well, the track got a little tackier, and uh, we can't get a race car quite the way we run it. We're pretty tight, and uh, we're just not working that good, or we could have went to the front. Everybody seems to be complaining about the race car. It's just uh, not loose enough, uh, and uh, it seems as if the evening goes on here and it gets a little bit cooler. It seems to the track seems to be getting even heavier. Well, I think they had a lot of rain down there the last couple of days, you know, a tremendous amount of rain, and uh, evidently the rain sunk down in the racetrack, and now it's trying to bleed its way back up through, and it, uh, it's just getting stickier and stickier. Okay, thanks, Keith. And now let's go to Steve with Mike Ward. Well, Mike, Mike, I'm sure the last thing that was going through your mind as you were upside down was uh, ever starting again in the B main, let alone making it to the A. Great job. Thank you. Um, I had a lot of luck. And a good crew. Yes, we definitely got a good crew. Some, some others pitched in. It makes everything work out pretty nice. Let's talk about the right rear tire on this vehicle. We talked to uh, Randy, the winner of the B-Main, about his, and he was very happy with it. What do you see? That's the driving tire on this race car. Uh, right now, we're, the racetrack's rough, and the tire's hooking the ruts, which is making the car straighten up. Um, we're trying to unhook the car right now. The, the, right, the right rear is pinning the car so much now with the right the racetrack are rough like it is. So what do you do, Mike? Uh, increase the air pressure. That's about all you can do? Stick the wheel further out. With a spacer? Yes, sir. All right, we'll see you then. Great job. Thank you. All right, there is a man who's going to put on a show no matter what. Mike Ward and a whole bunch of other guys are going to come back for the main event here at the Big Muddy Show in the Outlaw Circuit and let you load it up on some concessions. This young man 
got himself some nachos and his soft drink. He'll be ready for the start. And out front on the straightaway, Steve's ready, too, with a man on the pole. Well, Brock, I don't think there's anybody in this place that is having any more fun than the man that sits on the pole for the A-Main, Don Kreitz. Don, you've told us before you'd never seen this track till you arrived here. Uh, you've won the trophy dash. You've qualified very high. What a night. So far, I like uh, Memphis and Tennessee pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> How do you see this final? The track is rough. Uh, it's not good. Let's be honest about it. No, it's, it's very ripply, and uh, I really see it as, uh, it seems to me like it's, it's pretty hard to pass, and I'm kind of worried about lap traffic. It's going to be important, whoever gets to jump, if uh, Jack Horton Shield beats me into the corner or not, and, and if I get it, then it's just going to be whoever maneuvers the lap traffic right. We wish you the very best and have a safe ride. Okay, thank you. Speaking of uh, Jack Howden's child, let's go to Brock Yates. Do you think the racetrack, with, with getting a lot of heat into it with the race cars running, it's going to loosen up a little bit near the end of this deal? Well, I don't, I don't think it'll loosen up too much. Uh, you know, I think a little moisture will come up, and if anything, the track will probably just get a little rougher. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be the guy that's it's got a loose race car. A yeah, big hole over in three. Uh, that's where Ward got into trouble in uh, in in the B main. Uh, uh, you don't mind driving through the heavy stuff, do though, do you? Well, Daryl's <laughs> usually got the car pretty loose enough so uh, we can run anywhere in the racetrack. So you know we'll try and uh, dodge the holes if we can, and if we gotta go through them, we'll go through them. I know you will. Well, good luck, Jack. All right, thank okay. you. Jack Cottonchild, one of the hardest drivers in the business. He's ready to go in car 48. Steve. Thank you, Brock. Starting inside of the second row is the 4A car, Rick Unger. And uh, Rick, you're in a good position. Yeah, I'd uh, definitely rather be up here than a little farther back the way the conditions are tonight. If we can keep from making any uh, tremendous errors, we should be able to stay up here pretty good. Uh -huh. Can you go high? Would you go high? Desperate men do desperate things. Yeah, that, I don't and I don't plan on it. I don't know. I'm, I'm usually generally kind of a bottom. I, I generally like racing on the bottom a little bit anyway, so I'd have to be pretty desperate, I think, before I'd, before I'd go there. I'll tell you, there's some rough spots on the bottom, too. Mike Ward found that out in the B-Main. Yeah, it's it's getting rougher, I think, as night goes on. It's getting colder and damp, and, and uh, like I said earlier, it's the first time they ran a track this year, so it, you know, it's nothing we didn't kind of figure might happen. Well, our best uh, of luck to you, and uh, let's keep the wings straight, huh? I hope so. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right, back. Well, Steve, I'm with Doug Wolfgang. I'll start on the outside of the second row. And, Doug, uh, you really haven't had a whole lot of running here other than time trial and running in the dash. Uh, is that an advantage or a disadvantage with this racetrack being a little tricky the way it is? Uh, it might be a disadvantage tonight because the track is getting spongier and spongier as, we, as the night goes on. We haven't got that many laps, so we don't really know where we're at on our setup. But on the other hand, we start fourth, and it's better than starting eighth or tenth. <laughs> Yeah, the, everybody's been trying to loosen the cars up uh, throughout the evening, and everybody says they're, they're just getting tighter and tighter. Uh, do you just eyeball it in and hope? Yeah, we're not doing too much. We're just going to run. I, I, these tracks like this, there's nothing you can do anyway. I don't know why guys work so hard, because they're still going to be tight, so you just want to drive it the way it is and forget about it. <laughs> okay, well, I hope it works for you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Doug Wolfgang. Steve? Brock starting on the inside of the third row is the 17 E car and Chris Each. Chris, how do you feel about the race car you have under you for this main event? Well, yeah, you know, it felt pretty good. You know, it's it's a little little tippy. You know, this track's real sticky, and uh, but I think we got it worked out. You know, we changed a bunch of things, and I think we'll be pretty good in the main. Tippy sounds like a scary term to me. Well, yeah, it really is on a fast track like this. You know, you, you go into the corner and you stand up, and there ain't a whole lot you can do. And it would maybe tip over if you'd let it. Well, yeah, if you'd let it, but you don't want to let it. <laughs> no, definitely don't do that. Uh, win some money tonight. Okay, thank you. All right, Brock. Well, Steve, uh, Randy Smith is going to start on the outside of the third row. That's behind Wolfgang and up ahead of him, Hoddenchild. But uh, do you think you guys on the outside got the fast way around, or is, uh, would you rather be down low tonight? Right now, I don't think it matters. It's sticky everywhere you go out there, and it's just who can hold the straight line and not get hooked <laughs> up too hard. Just keep the race car straight. Huh? You don't want to try to slide. You're going to slide anyway, right? Uh, I don't think very many of them will be sliding around tonight. <laughs> Uh, did you loosen it up as much as you could? 
I done everything I can think of. I'm sure there's something else we're missing, but we're as loose as we can get it. Think of that as soon as the green flag drops, right? I'm sure we will. <laughs> That's the way it always is. Well, good luck, Randy. Thank you. Okay. Steve? Well, Brock, it's got to be a little disappointing for Jeff Swindell in the 11X car to be clear back here in the 10th position when there's a fellow from Pennsylvania who's never seen your home track on the pole. Well, it's just a bad situation, I guess. The racetrack uh, turned around, got heavy and rough on us, and and we just didn't quite catch it quick enough in the heat race there. Uh, if we had screwed up in the heat race, we'd have been in the dash, so that would put us probably on the first, second row, you know. But I tell you, that's how it goes. I think uh, this racetrack probably has produced a heck of a race for the fans to watch, you know. So maybe uh, if the cameras will look back here for a little while, they'll watch us go to the front, we're going to stand on the gas. We'll be watching. Thanks a lot. Okay, Brock, let's go racing. Well, Steve, here's another man we'll be watching, as well as the fans. This is Bobby Davis. Jr., one of the local favorites like Jeff, but he's starting way back in the 21st spot. We'll watch him run hard here like the rest of these guys as the A-Main starts here at Memphis, Tennessee. To travel from Memphis to Arkansas, well, you take that beautiful bridge. That's Interstate 40, and under the bridge is constant barge and tug traffic, such as the Laura B., one of the little guys that moves commodities mainly right here in the port of Memphis. But back at Memphis Motorsports Park, well, I don't have to tell loyal sprint car fans what they're saying. That's the four abreast salute to the crowd. That's right. That is serious traffic right there, Steve. As they come down the front straightaway, getting ready to go in the 20 lap, uh, a main. Now, we talked earlier about a 25 lapper, but track conditions are such that the World of Outlaw officials have reduced the uh, lap distance by five laps. So, if, if anybody in the back of the field is going to get it done and move to the front and challenge Don Kreitz and some of the guys up front, they're going to have to work a little bit harder. And they've got Jack Howdenchild, Don Kreitz, Rick Unger, and Doug Wolfgang in the top four to deal with. So, the guys at the back, like Tim Green, Danny Smith, some of the guys that we've seen run well, have definitely got their work cut out for them. Even if you run well enough to say win the B main, that doesn't mean you're gonna start in the middle or the front of the pack. It all depends on what your qualifying time was. That is uh, of real importance in outlaw competition as far as determining the field. So you may win the B main and start next to last if you were a slow qualifier. Well, in the case of Randy Wolf, who did win the B main, he was the sixth quickest qualifier and will start on the inside of row five. That's in the ninth starting position. As we watch the field form up in the customary two by two starting order on this rather chilly, quite flat and rather bumpy half mile here at Memphis, Steve. Well, Brock, it's difficult to even walk on this racetrack. It's so tacky, let alone race on it as they come out at turn number three into four, looking for the green, and we have a start of the A main. Johnny Kreitz in the 69K leads him down into turn number one in the black and gold 48 of Jack Howden Chow immediately whistles by on the outside and look at Jeff Swindell in the orange 11X. He's already passed Randy Wolf, Craig Keel, and Keith Coffin is challenging Randy Smith for the fifth spot. Well, Jeff Swindell, true to his word, he said, point your camera at the orange 11X car and I'll show you some smoke. Well, you're seeing it right here as Swindell moves up much to the crowd's delight. And for the second position, what a battle here. Young Don Price Jr., we saw the speed down to 109 miles per hour. That means the racetrack is not as fast as it was earlier. And that is Wolfgang, the Wolf, in the 8D car on the outside. Nobody but the Wolf would go up there. And he may not try it again because it did not work. And Don Price moves out to hold on to that second spot. And now back to Jess Swindell in the 11X. He's broken clear of Randy Smith in the Black 7 and is now moving in on Rick Unger in that red 4A. Look at Jeff Swindell, ride high, just like Wolfgang is. Maybe there's a groove up there, Steve. Well, maybe so, but how about Don Troitz Jr.? He's running in second of the 69K car, and the Wolf cannot catch him. In fact, if anything, Christ is pulling out. Don Kreitz has uh, lost that lead right away when Jack Hodenschild just blasted by him coming off of turn number two, but now seems to be gaining some strength. Here is that race for fourth one more time. Jess Wendell, Orange 11X, the Red 4A of Rick Unger, Indianapolis, Indiana, down the front straightaway. Jess Wendell rides high, trying him on the outside. It appears to be working as Wendell now may duck low as they head into turn number three. Nope, stays high. 
Swim down. Oh, they almost touched down there as they come down the front straightaway. Hunger holds them off, though. Hunger won't give a bit. The local guy, Jess Lindell, and can find his way around this racetrack blindfolded. Can't get around Hunger. And look at this, 116 miles per hour. I said earlier the track was slowing down. That's one of the best speeds we've seen all night. And how about this? 69K Don Price Jr. has closed up. He has passed for the lead. He has driven right around the black and gold car of Jack Houses child. What a launch he got off turn number two and did it come at a good time because the caution is out. So as the field slows down, Don Price Jr. has reestablished himself in the lead. The reason for the caution, this is Greg Hodnett from right here in Memphis who has uh, obviously gotten some mechanical problems. He is on the racetrack, so the field will slow up until they get things cleared. So this will give everybody a chance to gather their thoughts uh, as the field circulates for a few laps under the uh, leadership of Don Price Jr. But right behind him is Jack Hodenchild, who came in here with a car with a different wing setup. Earlier, Steve had a look at that change. The huge wings on these outlaw sprinters certainly accomplish the purpose for which they were designed. Air flowing over them provides downforce for traction, stability, and a bit of safety, too, in case of an upset. But they're also a tremendous drag through the air, almost like uh, pulling an anchor or a parachute. Wouldn't it be nice if you could accomplish the same downforce with a smaller wing that offered less drag and was maybe even a little more handsome? Take a look at the 48 car of Jack Howden's child. This is the only machine using what's called a dual element wing. It's not one piece all the way through here. You see this little slit? Well, that offers the same downforce in the same area as a much larger wing, but not nearly as much drag, which means the car will go faster and a bit quicker. Now, this technology is being used currently on top fuel dragsters and drag racing, and they stole it from the Indianapolis guys who stole it from Formula One, who stole it from an airplane about 10 years ago. So that's called the trickle-down effect. Look for a dual-element wing on almost all these cars in the near future, and also wings not only adjustable this way, but laterally. So the aerodynamics become more and more a factor as the world of outlaws proceed year by year. As we watch Richard Bailey, the chief starter here, continue to wave the yellow flag. Don Price Jr., Howden Child, Wolfgang right there in third, Unger and Swindell in the top five. Keith Kaufman, Ish, Smith, Lasowski, and Joe Garrity round out the top ten as we get ready for a restart here, Steve Evans. Don Price Jr. in front, enjoying the race of his life here in Memphis as he leads him down. Oh, and look at Andy Hillenberg, the two car. Oh, Jack Hewitt, the orange machine, is out of the park. We have got, well, a serious incident, Brock, at right. least three cars involved. That's Todd Kane and the other car, the 63. Both he and Hillenberg upside down on the racetrack. And as you said, Jack Hewitt completely out of the park in turn number three. Obviously, the field has been red flagged. The emergency vehicles are headed for the scene. That, too, of course, is the place where we had that big run in the racetrack. I don't know whether that's a factor. Jack Hewitt out of the car. Thank goodness. He is all right. That race car completely out of the park. Here comes Andy Ellenberg crawling out of that black number two, that beautiful automobile. And here comes, thankfully, Todd Kane emerging from his accident. So we've got three drivers apparently all right. Well, Jack Hewitt certainly is healthy, but you may have noticed Andy Hillenberg was a bit rocky and needed some support in walking away from that vehicle. Here it is again. Watch the black number two car, Andy Hillenberg. On his outside is the 56 car, Danny Smith. They may have touched there. Whatever happened caused this incident. Andy Hillenberg upside down. Jack Hewitt had nowhere to go. Neither did Todd Kane in the 63 car. Hillenberg really triggered a chain reaction here at what is very close to being the fastest part of the racetrack. Brock is with Jack Hewitt, a lucky man. Well, Jack Hewitt, uh, tell me exactly what happened, Jack. First of all, you, you're you apparently okay. Yeah, I'm fine, thank good. you. That's good. Uh, how did we get into it? What happened? Uh, we really all got to jumping up and bunching up in the back straightaway, and we come in here, all I seen was Andy flipping, and I was kind of committed to the high side, and him and Todd got together, and I just didn't have no place to go, you know, and I just ran into him, and it put us on the other side of the concrete wall. <laughs> One of those sprint car racing deals, huh? <laughs> yeah, if we didn't have that now and then, I guess all them people up there wouldn't be down there doing this. That's right, absolutely. Well, we're just glad you're okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jack. You okay, Is that a tough guy? You better believe it. As he walks over to talk with Todd Kane, who appears to be all right. And now let's go to Steve with Andy Hillenberg. Well, Brock, Andy Hillenberg is shaken, as you might well imagine. I'm a little bit shaken just uh, having watched what we saw here in turn number three. Apparently his 
elbow is bothering him. We'll try to get a word with him if he's comfortable, but I, that may not be possible. I think the man needs uh, some rest, maybe more than anything else. Andy, you okay? Yeah, just a little dizzy. <clears throat> rough racetrack? Yeah, it's pretty rough, pretty fast, so kind of easy to get in trouble. <laughs> Indeed. Let's let him rest. Well, as safe as these sprint cars have become, the big wing, certainly part of that, there is still always the threat of physical injury. Jack Hewitt, a lucky man, as his 23S car flew completely out of the park. Todd Kane's car has sustained major, major damage. Even the racetrack has suffered. The flipping machines have dug even some new holes. Let's go to Brock Yates with Todd Kane. First of all, Todd, are you okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just shook up a little bit, but I'm all right. Uh, what happened? You and Andy must have gotten into it together, or was uh, he going before you got into Andy it? Andy got hit a rut and got sideways and then like he was already kind of flipping and then jack's on the outside and then i think i hit andy and then i hit jack over the wall i mean it just all broke loose because they're all bunched up there tight sure, and sure. then just something happened i think like i think he had a rut there somewhere back there and just kind of got him sideways and then like jack was there and i was there and i had nowhere to go and just drove right into it was uh were you were you flat out i mean were, were you coming out. you were running hard huh yeah yeah, yeah. you guys start you guys tend to start about on turn uh, uh turn two I here coming out of turn two <laughs> i mean because all bunched up and i thought sure. they were going so i went for it maybe that's the time i should have kind of relaxed if i could do relax here then you're with the back yeah. yeah well i'm glad you're okay that's what most important right now right it is thanks yes sir thank you Todd. Well, Todd said it at the top of that interview, Andy hit a bump, and that's where the fault lies in this three-car incident, certainly not with the talent of any of the men involved. And here we see the 63 car of Todd Kane being attended to as they try to get it back to his pits. It's certainly a damaged race car. Stay with us for the restart. Today, we're going to find out why America rides Monroe shocks and struts. Sir, why do you ride Monroe? It's the better handling. Oh, says her. Huh? It's the smoother ride. Better handling. Smoother ride. Better handling. Smoother. No, listen, Billy. Well, whatever your reason, see your Monroe ride expert for the best ride ever. <laughs> Guaranteed. No wonder America rides Monroe shocks and struts. With just a finger's width of tire between you and the road, you need world-class technology, quality engineered to give you Bridgestone confidence. No matter what, it just makes sense. You can't drive today. Hi, I'm Chuck Woolery. I love cars, but I hate grease, just like this greasy engine. But now there's clear magic. Just spray it on, hose it off, and grease and grime disappear like magic. You see this grease spot on my shirt, clear magic and water, and it's gone. It's non-toxic, it's non-flammable, and it's totally biodegradable. Clear magic has a thousand different uses around the house, but don't tell your wife or it'll disappear. Like magic. Clear magic. So long, suckers! In the world of high-speed travel, it's easy to get misdirected, totally rejected, and dangerously affected. Hello? But it's impossible to slow down. That feels good. <laughs> See Speeds on the Movie, play Speeds on the Game. Win a trip to the Daytona 500. Call 1-900-988-6666. Free poster and trip contest details to all cars. 250 per call on touchdown phones only. Rated PG. Now playing at theaters everywhere. TNN takes you close to all the action with Sports Sunday. You'll reel in the excitement on Hank Parker's Outdoor Magazine and catch the competition of the pros on Bassmasters. Experience the high-pressure thrills of racing's hidden heroes. The NASCAR-style competition on Inside Western Cup Racing and the sensational events on American Sports Cavalcade. Then hang on tight for the rough riding of Mesquite Championship Rodeo and the high-flying excitement of Motor World. All this and more, Sports Sunday on TNN. We're back in Memphis, Tennessee, where the big money showdown of the world of outlaws is under caution after this automobile and two others had an enormous crash entering turn number three on a restart after another caution. That is the black number two of Andy Hillenberg, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. You see him here after just taking the green flag, moving in on Randy Smith in the red 56, and suddenly catches a rut 
and begins this wild tumble. Right behind him comes Jack Hewitt in the orange automobile and Todd Kane right behind him. Hewitt out of the park, Kane and Andy Hillenberg upside down. Fortunately, all of them all right, Steve Evans. They are all just fine, Brock, and the villain here, as I said before, is the racetrack itself, and it is not gonna get any better. There you see Todd Kane's automobile being hauled away. Big damage to the wings, but believe it or not, it looks as if the chassis is not terribly deformed. These automobiles can take horrible impact and still be ready to race in a matter of hours. And what stories already we have right up front. Don Price Jr. started on the pole, then lost the lead to Jack Howden's child. Battle back again as the leader. Doug Wolfgang, lying there in third, just ready to strike. Rick Unger, Jeff Swindell, some tremendous action has got to come here with a restart, Brock. Well, we've got all of the uh, hot runners kind of formed up front here as Kaufman, uh, don't forget him in that six spot, always a tough runner. So they're in single file. There is Don Price Jr. in that blue automobile. And here comes the green. Don Price Jr. off turn number three and immediately Howden Child challenges down the front straight. Well, there is Price protecting that inside line. This is almost an instant replay of lap number one. There goes Howden Child, pitches it sideways, takes the lead down the back straight. What a move by Hodgenchild. Just pitched that automobile in 117 miles an hour down the back straightaway. As now, Doug Wolfgang begins to move in and challenge Don Price for the second spot. Doug Wolfgang in that white 8D moving it on again on the high side on Don Price Jr. And look at Wolfgang. He just blows right by him to take that second position. Mike Ward, the 88 car. Whoop, he had moved up to 17th. That little bobble caught to the spot. He's now an 8D. So Don Christ Jr. has fallen back a little bit, and here is your race for fourth. Number three, Keith Kaufman, 11X. That's Jeff Swindell, and they are trying to move in on Don Christ Jr. as well. Now, what happened during that red flag, during that incident, Steve? Obviously, some guys made some serious chassis changes, and I don't think Don Christ picked the right combination. Don has fallen back. He seems to have just lost that ability. The car's a lot tighter than everybody else's. And here comes Kaufman and Jeff Swindell. They are moving in to challenge him. Both those guys made whatever changes were necessary, and their cars are working pretty good. Look at this. This is Doug Wolfgang, the 8D car. The wing has collapsed. Apparently, the supports have given way. Wolfgang in a highly vulnerable position on the racetrack. The yellow flag wisely comes out. That wing, you understand, has many, many hundreds of pounds of air pressure on it, and apparently it just succumbed to that pressure. Rare, rare incident. I've never seen this happen before, but it puts Doug Wolfgang out of this event while he was running second. We'll be back at Memphis right after this. Cape Hatteras and Old Milwaukee both mean something great to these guys. Hatteras means surf casting for bluefish, and man, do they love to fight. And Old Milwaukee means a great beer. Cold, crisp Old Milwaukee beer. And smooth, golden Old Milwaukee life. There's nothing like the flavor of a special place. And Old Milwaukee beer. Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee light. Hey, guys. This doesn't get any better than this. he's working, when his work is done, a man wants a jean he can feel comfortable in. American Hero Jeans. From Rank. Meet the two toughest cops in town. All right, get in the back. One's just a little smarter than the other. Uh. It's okay. All right, I'll split it with you. I'll split it with you. I'll split it with you. Okay. Look, let's get one thing straight. The woman is mine. In the dog-eat-dog -dog world of crime. You look like you've been in a skiing accident. A man's best friend just might be man's best friend. James Belushi in K-9. Rated PG-13. Starts Friday at theaters everywhere. Dwight Yoko. K.T. Oslin. Ronnie Millsap. Randy Travis. The Judge. They are just a few of the stars that you'll see on the second annual TNN Viewer's Choice Award. Live from the Grand Ole Opry House. Hi, I'm Lori Ann Crow. And I'm Charlie Chase. We would like to invite you to join us immediately following the show as we talk with the winners. And highlight all of the evening's festivities in a live half-hour special.
CNN Viewer's Choice Post Award Show with Crook and Chase, Tuesday, April 25th on TNN. Go behind the scenes with Auto Racing's hard-charging pit crews. Dave Bowman takes you there to experience all the tension and drama as the very best are challenged by some of the most demanding jobs in racing. The Hidden Heroes, Sports Sundays on TNN. If you ever had any doubt as to why they call the Mississippi River the Big Muddy, just take a look at the texture of the water. As we say goodbye to Clyde Kitchen and the Betsy Diane, our thanks to Clyde for his tour of the Memphis Port. And the next time you visit this beautiful city, maybe you ought to look behind the tourist attractions and some of the things that make Memphis, Tennessee so very interesting. It is a fascinating area indeed, but right now the men here at the Memphis Motorsports Park have got their mind on one thing, and that is victory in the big muddy showdown. Jack Howdenchild, who currently leads it while we're under caution, has got to be breathing a little sigh of relief because his major tormentor, at least potential tormentor, Doug Wolfgang, is out with a freak collapse of the wing, which uh, suddenly just gave way on him as he went through turn number three, and he is parked in the infield. A similar situation to having the hood come up on your car, only in reverse. This went down instead of up. We're going to get a restart. They're already bumping and banging in the middle of the back in outlaw fashion. Uh, here comes Hodgenchild. Off turn number four. He has a big lead. Right behind him, John Price Jr. There's the green flag. And Keith Kaufman in the blue number three moves in to challenge Price. Behind him, Jeff Swindell. So we've got four hard runners challenging up front. Much like Christ, Jeff Swindell's car still appears to be a bit tight. You can see him yep. biting it there, and that's going to hurt him now. All right, Kaufman rides in third. Right behind him, Jeff Swindell in the 11X, the orange car. And right behind him is the 17E of Chris East. So these three automobiles beginning to work their way through the field while out front is Jack Hodgenchild and Don Price Jr. So the field is spreading out a little bit, Steve. Traffic not quite as big a factor as it was. Well, it looks like Jeff Swindell in the 11X car is starting to make up some ground on Keith Kaufman. He can do it in the turns. He loses it on the straightaway. This is that battle for third position. And there goes Jeff Swindell down on the inside. Let's see if he can hold that line and tuck underneath Kaufman. No, he cannot do it. This is a tremendous, even a classic sprint car matchup for that third spot. Jeff Swindell takes advantage of a mistake on the part of Coffin. Coffin slid a little bit high. Jeff Swindell darted down where he needed to be. Terrific pass. Let's go to Brock Gage with a man who wishes he was out there and should be, really. With Doug Wolfgang, uh, whose wing just uh, took a hike on him. I've never seen that before. Has that happened to you before, Doug? When the wings fall. It, uh, it just came apart on you? No, the wing didn't. Uh, the ace brace on the front of it off the roll cage broke. The track's so rough, it just vibrated and broke. Oh, that's too bad. We're sorry you're out. Thanks. Well, if the track can do that to a race car, what is it doing to the bodies that are indeed still out there folded in these 1,250-pound machines? Here, one of Doug's crew takes the wing off of the car, and you can bet this whole car will be stripped at every weld, every joint check. That's just the kind of beating they're getting here tonight. Right now, though, that wing will come off and they head for the trash heap as they load up and head for yet another outlaw race down the road. So Doug Wolfgang finished, but not these two guys. That's Jack Hodgenshaw, the black and gold 48, in the lead here, but now with two laps left, beginning to be challenged by Don Price Jr. in that beautiful blue number 69K. And you remember earlier, Don Price said, I think the car is good, but I don't know if I have the stamina to run 20 laps with these guys. Well, that question is being answered as we go into the last lap and look at Price down low. Can he do it? He's up alongside. He is out in front. He puts the nose out in front of Jack Hodgenshout. Down into turn number three, side by side, but Hodgenshout blasts by him down the front straightaway, and he will take the victory. Jack Hodgenshout resists a gallant challenge on the final lap by Don Price Jr. to take the win here in the Big Muddy Showdown. Boy, that was as fine a final lap as we have seen in the world of Outlaws competition in a long, long time. Our hats are off to Jack Hodgenshout, who won it and it's Don Price Jr. who tried so very hard. Well, there we see Jack Hodgenchild uh, on the cool-down lap. We'll talk to him, but let's take another look at this daring challenge by Don Price Jr. down the back straightaway. There you see him come almost alongside him, but
But at this point, as they head down into turn number three, Jack Houdenchild simply does not lift and sails by on his way to victory. Steve's with him. Well, it's on nights like this that a sprint car driver truly earns his money. Jack Howden's child, it was more like the Baja 1000 than 20 laps. Yeah, the track got real rough right there at the end of the race. And, uh, you know, we was just trying everywhere in the racetrack here. And, uh, and we, had to, we had a good race. Wolfgang appeared to be moving up on you until his wing collapsed. He might have been a threat had he stayed out. Well, you know, if he's out there, you know, he's always a threat. You know, he can win any time. So, you know... Uh, we're just glad to win. You know, I could see you inside the car being bounced around furiously. How do you feel? Uh, I feel pretty good. Uh, you know, it's a good workout. Uh, you could feel it when it gets this rough. You can you can feel it in your bones. But uh, you know, everything worked out good. It sure did. Congratulations again. A brilliant drive. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, let's go to Brock with second place. Well, Don, good ride. Uh, I'll tell you, getting going down into turn two uh, on the last lap, I thought maybe you had a shot at him. Yeah, so did I. He drove, a, he drove a good race. He kind of didn't give us a whole lot of room in three, but I guess I would have done the same if I would have been in the lead. You, uh, he, he seemed to get by you pretty easy at the st on, on the restart. He seemed just to have more punch down the straights than you did, but then you seemed to uh, kind of settle in and then stay only about two or three car lengths behind him all the way, and then right near the end, you got right in behind. Or, you know, you took a shot at him. Uh, did you lay back a little bit, or did, the, did uh, do you think he started to lose some tire maybe? Oh, I didn't really understand what my car was doing all, all night long when the restarts and the first initial for the first lap going in the first corner and the third corner it would push straight up across the track and then after like one or two laps it would be fine and I, and I don't know why as cool as it is it ain't like the front tires that they had to get heat in or anything right. like that I just don't know why it did it but it did it all night long okay Don thanks now let's go to Jeff Swindell Jeff when we talked on the grid you said I want to put on a show for the hometown fans you certainly did that you said if I can just get in the top four you did one better than that yeah well you know starting from 10th on this the way this thing was so heavy and rough tonight you know I, I tell you the top four was a good finish you know I figured that was putting our sights in within reason I figured we could probably get there if the brakes came our way we had the race car on the track all night and the heat race and the B and so we probably had more laps than the rest of these guys so that probably helped us out a lot you said also I'm gonna go high you dabble with that and abandon that plan real quick well actually I could go up to the top and uh, I was running the top getting in just about all the time but I'd come back to the bottom because it was a little quicker to come back to the bottom and get you off a little faster and it wasn't quite as many ruts to contend with so uh, when we weren't in traffic I'd go in high and come back across the ruts to the bottom but uh, if we had to go around somebody we'd go up around them and and if we had to go underneath them we, we went underneath them you know Richard Brown and guys got the car working real nice so when you can get a race car working to where you can drive it anywhere on the racetrack on a, a heavy rough deal like this i tell you it works great thanks for a good show thanks a lot okay brock well steve thanks to all these guys for a great show here at memphis Hodgechild, Kreitz, swindell kaufman ish in the top five rounding out the top ten unger lasoski keel garrity and green for steve evans i'm brock yates thanks for joining us the executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Palish, produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship team. The nation's premier source of fast lane fashions, Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life. And by this special offer from Diamond P. You know, for six award-winning seasons on American Sports Cavalcade, we've shared the excitement as fearless competitors push too far. Yet, miraculously, we've watched them walk away. Diamond P has now captured all this excitement on a spectacular new home video called, And They Walked Away. The mayhem of motocross, the tumbles of sprint cars, the spins of stock cars, 60 minutes of breathtaking footage. For your copy, call 1-800-453-9300 or send a check or money order to this address. Just $24.95 plus $350 shipping and handling. Visa and MasterCard accepted. Call 1-800-453-9300 now. The American Sports Cavalcade is a presentation of Diamond B Sports. Brought to you by Dodge Cars and Trucks. On the street or off the road, it's the new spirit of Dodge. By Stro Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee Light. It doesn't get any better than this. And by Armor All Cleaner and Armor All Car Wash. Because we're crazy about cars too.
music, variety, sports, and information. You're enjoying TNN with more stars, more shows, and specials to entertain and brighten your day. TNN, the Nashville Network. When it comes to making great wheels look their best, Eagle One doesn't miss a beat. Eagle One, masters in the art of visual perfection. Eagle One's professional guide to auto detailing available now at participating retailers. Would you like to experience the thrill of driving a high-powered drag racing machine free? Well, 10 winners in the TNN sweepstakes to celebrate the AutoZone Castle GTX Mid-South Nationals at Memphis Motorsports Park May 4th through the 7th will receive full scholarship at the famed drag racing school in Gainesville, Florida. Additionally, one of the 10 will receive an all-expense-paid trip for two to this fantastic NHRA drag race. To enter, stop by your participating AutoZone store or send a postcard with your name, address, and phone number to this address. The second annual TNN Viewer's Choice Awards, Tuesday on TNN. 